This piece we're really excited um, about. This is uh, David Little's Haunt of Last Night Fall. This was a piece that uh, Third Coast Percussion commissioned uh, from the young composer, young New York-based composer, David Little. We premiered it last December in Chicago, and the video is of that premiere performance. This piece is a half an hour long. It's, it's a grand scale work. It involves not only just a plethora of percussion instruments, but also a very integrated audio component as well that the composer uses. A lot of keyboard percussion in this, and you have some of the, the standard instruments. Uh, Dave starts off the work uh, on a solo marimba uh, section. Marimba, vibraphone, glockenspiels, xylophone, crotales, all like the, the standard ones. And then we also have um, an enormous amount of tuned metal pipes. These metal pipes are similar to what uh, you would hear in David Lang's so-called Laws of Nature and Paul Lansky's Threads. Uh, they're just different pitches of them and you'll hear it uh, towards the middle of the work where um, all these metal pipes are going along together and hocketed back and forth throughout the ensemble. David was really interested and has been influenced a lot by composers uh, like Lou Harrison, uh, so a lot of earlier percussion music by Lou Harrison. Um, another really big influence on David's entire aesthetic is uh, popular music, specifically heavy metal music, and he cites, for those of you that are into uh, heavy metal or hardcore or industrial music, uh, David cites specifically ministry as one of the main influences uh, on this work, as, as well as a variety of other, of other things. Yeah, he mentions uh, a group called Sun, um, and another group, uh, uh, One Day as a Lion, uh, which is a lot of former members from Rage Against the Machine. One of the things that um, I know David has mentioned that is interesting to him about that particular uh, sort of style of heavy metal music is that many of it is, is as complicated, uh, as sort of intricate and, 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 uh, and fascinating to him as concert music. So, for instance, the band Sun has these like really, really detuned guitars, um, you know, much tuned much lower than a standard tuning and really distorted so you just get these really big walls of sound um, that you know of course we associate with heavy metal because it's electric guitars that are distorted but um, if you just sort of flip the thing on its head and think of it as concert music it's really just an amazing sound um, and as percussionists of course we're fascinated by sounds so to get to sort of supplement our instruments with this pre-recorded track with these amazing distorted uh, guitar sounds and organ sounds and, and a bunch of other sounds um, was really was really fun really exciting The other major influence on a lot of David's work is um, politics. Uh, politics. Uh, David actually uh, just finished uh, his um, dissertation, dissertation at, at Princeton, so he's now a doctor, Dr. David Little, um, <laughs> and, and his dissertation was on music and politics. And, um, and this work is, is no exception. Um, there's sort of a, a, a broad influence that he had and a more specific influence. Broadly, uh, he was influenced by the idea of ghosts. 
and not ghosts like um, ghosts that haunt your house type ghosts, but um, the idea that um, once you have learned something, once you've heard something on the news or on the radio or someone has told you something, you can't forget it even if you want to. So there are things in our lives maybe that we experience that we almost wish that we could forget or things that we hear about that we almost wish that we can forget but they haunt us. They are our kind of ghosts. Specifically for David, uh, the, the thing that he heard about uh, that haunted him, that, that led him to write this piece for us, um, was uh, he heard about this, uh, this massacre that happened at a small town called El Mazote in El Salvador. It happened during the El Salvadoran Civil War in the, in the early 80s. And um, basically, a, a peaceful town was raided uh, by a, a heavily armed group of, of militants and um, and everyone in the, in the town was killed. So the, the sort of tragedy, the, the sort of horror of that event was something that, um, that David was, I think, dealing with when he was writing this piece and um, music can be so many things uh, and one of the things that it can be is it can be maybe therapeutic. These, you know, feelings that you have or, or, or um, things that haunt you if there's no way for you to forget them, maybe writing a piece about them, or for us maybe performing a piece that is influenced by that is a way to sort of, um, uh, to deal with, with these yeah. difficult things. And uh, uh, the specific story that uh, the piece is based on, uh, it was something that, that was uh, lesser known, or and continues to be uh, lesser known. It, it was a story that just didn't, uh, get out into the mass media as much um, as it should have. And that was something that resonated with David Little a lot. And um, with, with the bulk of his music, which, which usually has some type of socio-political undertone, um, it's not necessarily that he's making a comment. It's not a commentary on the event itself. He's not trying to judge one way or another. Uh, what I remember most vividly talking with him about is the idea of just bearing witness to something, the idea of, you know, it is something that's haunting him, it's this ghost, and, and it's this story that um, he never knew about, and now he just can't get out of his mind, and he wants to make sure that that story gets out to the rest of the world. Um, he says this piece is not programmatic, um, although um, it's very, very theatrical, and uh, theatrics play an enormous role in all his music. He writes a lot of opera, a lot of chamber opera stuff, writes a lot of stuff for voice. Um, David is a musician himself, He's actually a drum set player. Um, and uh, so a lot of um, very aggressive things that are happening. Um, uh, the theatricality um, that you'll see in the video too is how we decided to premiere it. It was in a, a smaller um, theater in Chicago uh, where we had uh, lighting and different effects and there was a whole stage set up and everything. So um, theater is, is a big component to this piece. Yeah, he even discussed how uh, this was almost, I think it was entirely unintentional, but sort of a happy accident that um, the way we set up the piece, and you'll see in the video, is, is a sort of a semicircle around an empty space on a stage. And what he sort of remarked once we were there and sound checking and, and, and after we had played the concert was that it's almost as if we set up a stage uh, and there are no actors. So it's almost, he referred to it as a ghost play. Ghost play, so, yes. So yeah. uh, you know, again, this idea of, of ghosts comes up. Um, like a, like a soundtrack for a play where the actors are, are absent.
One of the aspects about this piece, because the audio is so heavily involved, uh, or it, it's just integrated into the piece, uh, it, it's, it's its own part. Um, it's not just an afterthought in it, which will, again, you'll, you'll see from the video. Um, and because of that, and because there's so much so many different pauses and so many different sections and all this multimeter stuff, um, we ended up having to design a click track uh, for this piece. So for the entire duration of the half hour long work, uh, we have little earbuds uh, in our ears uh, to make sure that we're all playing together. It's like a custom <laughs> metronome that follows the meter of, uh, and tempo of every different section of the piece and it's synced up to the computer that is also sending out the audio. So if you're watching it and you're wondering, how in the heck are those guys staying together with the like lightning speed guitar riffs that are flying by? <laughs> <laughs> and we're also uh, very much spread out, you know, across the entire stage. It's an enormous amount of instruments, and we're in this gigantic sort of U formation in a different setup that we would never do um, in most normal circumstances. In most repertoire that we play, we we tend to um, be as close as possible because eye contact and you know unspoken communication is just so important to a chamber ensemble. This is a little bit different experience. Not that we're not listening to each other, not that we're not communicating, but we do have this extra sort of conductor. It's the, the ghost conductor. Right. <laughs> The piece itself, it's, um, it's actually quite standard, um, the performance aspect of it, you know? The um, instrumentation, the, I mean, there's a lot of instruments, but it's in instruments that you'll find in most, if not all, college percussion programs. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're, again, you're dealing with very standard keyboard instruments, aside from the metal pipes, the which two are, metal pipes, which are becoming more and more standard these days in, in the percussion make. repertoire. And, and very easy to make, you just go to Home Depot and cut some pipes, and that's it. Um, and even, you know, the, the drums and other percussive instruments, all very, very standard stuff. Uh, some of the more exotic stuff um, is actually just included in the audio. So you actually don't have to have a lot of these extra exotic, you know, four foot diameter tie gongs <laughs> or anything else like that. So it, it's definitely a very approachable piece um, for other ensembles and other students at both the high school and collegiate level. Um, a lot of the writing is generally very idiomatic. Again, uh, David Little uh, is a percussionist himself, so, so has an idea or, or, or a more deeper understanding of um, the idiomatics of the instruments and the technical requirements, you know, of them. There's a lot of back and forth motion between keyboard and drums, you know, throughout, and that's probably the most technically demanding, you know, material when we're, we're doing a lot of just back and forth motion. Yeah, like so much percussion music, um, in a chamber setting or a solo setting, you're having to negotiate multiple instruments, and so. Um, and so, particularly for, for your part and Rob's part, I yeah. feel like the challenge becomes, uh, you know, which mallets do I use that can work on both a tom-tom and a glockenspiel, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, my part, um, I, I, I want to say, I haven't played your part or the other parts, I want to say my part might, may be the most challenging, yeah. just because the, the beginning is, is really kind of a marimba solo, and it goes yeah. on for three or four minutes, and I memorized it, and I, I think it would be difficult to do not memorized. Um, so there are, there are challenging parts to the piece, but I, I, I definitely think it's approachable uh, by an ensemble mm -hmm. that's looking for a challenge and looking for something that's maybe a little outside of the norm in terms yeah. of percussion ensemble uh, yeah. literature. And one of the nice things about the piece is that it does involve like all these different instruments of percussion. It's not just like a drum piece, you know? It's not just a marimba quartet, you know? Um, it, he is I integrating like all these instruments together. Um, it's challenging, um, but it's also a very rewarding experience. And ultimately, like the piece benefits from that because it's just a much richer texture overall. And then you add on to that the audio component of it too. And, it, and it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a half hour long piece, but it doesn't feel like half an hour. I mean, you're just so immersed in the sound and it's so theatrical. Um, it, it's really a fantastic piece.
forget we were in uh, Texas uh, and we were sound checking in, in, in a venue right there and they, they were kind of concerned about like blowing out the house speakers. <laughs> but um, you know, the, the kids, particularly the, the middle school and high school kids afterwards, you know, coming up to us and you could just see the look in their eyes, you know, they're, they're so into it. It's very much like going to a rock and roll concert. You know, there, there's nothing precious, <laughs> you know, about, about this, this, this heavy piece. Metal, yeah, yeah, yeah or, or about the piece in general. I mean, the, there are these like the quieter, moments, like yeah. more delicate moments for sure, but um, it definitely has some teeth to it. And the uh, one audience reaction uh, that has come up, I think, a number of times is uh, it doesn't have a happy ending. No. That's not to say that it's, it's uh, well, first of all, not all music has to have a happy ending. Some of the best pieces ever written are devastating at the end. That's one of the things that music can do. Um, so it's not one that you're going to finish and everyone's going to high five each other and walk out and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very, uh, it's very dark. It's very dark, um, and and it's 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 weighty, but it's also there are moments that are that are really very very exciting. And mm -hmm. in that way, honestly, I think it's a lot like a lot of heavy metal music. I was it really is. into heavy metal music when I was younger. You were mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. um, and. Part of what feels amazing about heavy metal music is um, it's, it's sort of cathartic. You're sort of, all this sort of violent sound and really aggressive, energetic sound leaves you at the end sort of feeling uh, calmer, sort of drained of all that kind of thing. And I think this piece is very much like that because yeah. it has some huge, huge sounds and really high energy, high speeds, distorted sounds, all this kind of stuff. But, but at the end, a lot of audience reaction has been like, wow, um, that, was, it, that it was an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. That to, to get from the beginning to the end um, is enjoyable. But, but uh, does it leave you happy? No. But does it have to? No, I don't think no. music should have to. No.